Thank you to <coughs> Right Versatile, Brother Jacobs, and Right Versatile promoter, and also to Mrs. Walter and her library staff for having us here this evening. We are here at the Salon de la Rose Club. The original salons of the Rose Club were organized by Josephine Avadon, who you see here pictured before us. I found out two evenings ago that today is his birthday, as I was preparing for this lecture. He organized uh, the Salon de la Rose Club, which were big events that took place among the artistic community in Paris in the 1890s. They were part of his Rosicrucian order, which was called the Rose Croix Esthétique, the Aesthetic Rose Cross Order of the Temple and the Grave. The word aesthetic here is concerned with the quality of beauty, especially in art. Peladon wrote, Artists, you are a priest. Art is the great mystery. And when your effort ends in a masterpiece, a ray of the divine descends as on an altar. To understand art in the view of the Rose Cross, consider the idea that there is a tradition of divine knowledge, as old as mankind itself, which exists in every person naturally, like an instinct, and which can be remembered. Allegorically, this has been characterized as a lost language, a lost word, sometimes as a lost core. The memory of it can be activated by certain things, such as the books you read, meetings with extraordinary individuals, rituals, initiation, symbols, and most of all, by art. To give you an idea of how the artists of the French Rosicrucian tradition expressed this idea. I'd like to share an excerpt written by the French author, poet, and composer, Fa Dolide, who was a major influence on Peladon. And also, for those of you who are familiar with Papus, Papu, uh, Dr. Gerard Renfos, the founder of the Martinist Order, considered him his intellectual master, one of his greatest influences. Fab de Olivier, 1844, wrote the following. Hear this secret, young composers, who are seeking the perfection of the musical art. Know that the correspondence exists between souls, a secret and sympathetic humor, an unknown electricity that puts them in contact with one another. Of all the means of setting this fluid into motion, music offers the most powerful one. Would you communicate a sentiment, a passion to your listener? Would you awaken in them a memory, inspire in them a sentiment? Conceive this sentiment, this passion, strongly. Sow yourself in this memory, this presentiment. Work. The more energy you have put into feeling, the more strongly you will find your listeners feeling. They will experience in their turn <coughs> and in proportion to your energy and their own sensibilities the electrical impulse you have imprinted on the sympathetic fluid of which I have spoken. Consider the idea that art can stimulate an unconscious and ancient human instinct. Charles Darwin theorized that music making is a remnant of primitive communication because he observed that the instinct to produce music exists in other animals, such as birds and even humpback whales, who use many of the same rhythmic and song structures as our human phrasing patterns in song. So, to explain why music exists among the various species, some have proposed the idea that music must serve some evolutionary purpose. For example, we know that music triggers the hypothalamus to release endorphins, the neurotransmitters that promote a sense of well being and play a, an important role in social harmony. 
So some have suggested that music may have replaced grooming behaviors, which also triggered the release of endorphins. When the social groups too, grew too large for grooming to unite groups any longer. And music has predictable effects on the emotions. One study suggests that the acoustic frequencies of major and minor modes are similar to those of happy and sad speech, or excited and subdued speech. Another, found, another study found that people who had no previous exposure to Western music could still identify happiness, sadness, or fear in instrumental music excerpts. So researchers have concluded that Western music in particular seems to mimic the emotional cues of human speech, using many of the same rhythmic and melodic structures. This relationship between music and the emotional cues of human speech takes us deep into the microcosm, into the womb. Before birth, the senses of sight, smell, taste, and touch are limited. But the unborn child, through the amniotic fluid, perceives the sounds of its own body and those of the mother's and of the outside world. The various emotional states of the mother, which are also felt as emotions by the child, are accompanied by differences in tone, pitch, and rhythm of her voice. So think about this our very first notion of emotional meaning is associated with sound. After birth, we forget the experience of the womb and we acquire language. But throughout our lives, sound remains related to the unconscious memory of our earliest experiences. With this in mind, the experience of sound in the womb Consider that the oldest known musical instruments were found in caves in southwestern Germany, Austria, and the French Pyrenees. It has been suggested that these caves were sanctuaries of ancient initiation rites. Just think about how the experiences in these caves might have evoked the unconscious memory of the experience of the womb. Igor Reznikov, an archaeoacoustician, if you've ever heard of such a title, archaeoacoustician at the University of Paris, studied similar painted caves in Burgundy, France, and observed that the resonance in the cave is so strong that a simple low hum at the right pitch, like when you're standing in a room like this and you go, oh, but it really vibrates around you and you feel it in your body. He observed that in these painted caves, a simple hum at the right pitch is sufficient to help one proceed through the darkness. And less one think, by the way, that they just happen to paint these great chambers in these caves, and yes, they also produce resonance. Our ancient forefathers in the passageways between the great chambers where the paintings are found, marked the points of maximum resonance with red dots. So we know that they were making their way to these caves with acoustical resonance. Describing the experience that he discovered there, Igor Resnikov writes, the whole body co-vibrates with the gallery. It is like an identification a deep communion with earth, stone, and the mineral elements of creation. This flute is the oldest known musical instrument ever found. It was found in the cave Geisenposter in southern Germany, one of several caves in the region that has produced important examples of mythical and figurative art. The flutes found there are made from the bones of birds, 
and from the ivory of woolly mammoth tusks, and are dated by a carbon dating approximately 42,000 years old. These flutes are not mere whistle or noise makers. They're capable of playing expressive melodies in the tones of the pentatonic scale. And what's remarkable is that prehistoric flutes found in East Asia and dating back to 6,000 or 7,000 BCE have identical beveling techniques around the whole. And the alignment marks around the holes show that the same exact technique was used to determine the placement of the holes. An ancient tradition of music existing when a man 42,000 years ago was painting caves. But it is with the ancient Greeks that we arrive at music in the macrocosm. Pythagoras, who lived in the 6th century BCE, was the first to give a model for music that is scientific, in which further the ancient understanding of numerical proportion in nature. Nicomachus of Gerasa, Pythagorean, who lived in the 1st century CE, writes that Pythagoras walked by a stone <clears throat> and he heard the hammers beating out iron on the anvil and giving off a combination sounds which were most harmonious with one another, except for one combination. Then, by means of weights and strings, Pythagoras discovered the numerical proportions of those concordant or concordant or harmonious tones. He discovered the harmonic ratio. A, I'm going to spare you the details of the music theory behind it. But to cut to the chase, the mathematical proportions <coughs> of 2 to 1 produce the octave. The mathematical ratio of 3 to 2 gives the musical interval of the fifth. And the 4 to 3 ratio gives the musical interval of the fourth. This is basic root movement in Western music. It's rock and roll. Um, uh, uh, uh. Root, four, fifth, octave. These same mathematical ratios are not merely theoretical, they're actually inherent in nature. Here's something I think is truly fascinating. If you take a single string stretched between two points and you plug it, it will automatically find itself in certain nodes corresponding to these same numerical ratios and produce a series of what are called overtones. So when you pluck a string, not only does it sound the main tone or pitch that we hear, but also within that sound, it sounds above it, the octave, and then the fifth, and then the fourth, and so on in perfect harmony. Numerical proportion is perfectly present inherently in nature, unfailing. And when we perceive it, it's perceived with beauty. This is what Nicolaus Pythagorean says first about Pythagoras, that he was walking by the smithy and he heard concordant tones. He heard harmony and set out to discover the ratios behind those harmonious tones. The discovery of numerical proportion in the phenomenon of sound led to important speculations concerning proportion in the rest of nature. According to Nicomachos, the prototype of our music is the music of the planets. He writes, all swiftly whirling bodies necessarily produce sound. And he says, we ourselves do not hear this cosmic symphony with its deep complementation of sound and all embracing the tune as tradition describes. This is an interesting statement. Nicomachus 
in his time is referring to this harmony of the spheres, and he acts as tradition describes. Nicomachus also writes, it is probable that the names of the notes were derived from the seven stars which traverse the heavens. And he gives these correspondences. Now, of course, he does not give the, uh, the letter names uh, which were derived later or attributed later to these tongues, but the original names of the notes in the second column given by the Comicus of Agri, and his correspondences to the planets or astral bodies. This brings us to my dear brother, Tony Brousseau, who for us this evening has composed three original pieces of music that he's going to perform on his life. Brother Tony has employed three models of the harmony of the spheres, derived directly from the Greek, Orphic, Thackeray, and Platonic tradition. First, he is going to, uh, during the first composition, employ the Thackeray model of the harmony of the spheres, as it can be found in the manual of harmonics of Nicomachus. And Brother Tony's wife, Adrienne Isoberis, Isoberis, who is also a member of the Aesthetic Morse Squad, who will join him in this composition by reciting the Orphan Hymn to the Muses. This is the first piece to the Muses. Brother Tony's second composition, To the Stars, will employ the oldest Pythagorean model known to us, as it is described by Plato in his dialogue of Timaeus, which relates to the generation of the world soul by the Demiurge the master craftsman. Brother Tony's third composition, To All the Gods, will employ the most ancient Heptachord known to us in relationship to the seven planets and the seven sacred vows traditionally ascribed to them. Although it predates the Pythagoras, it is directly related to him since it became the basis of his own invention of the octachord, the eight-tone scale, which Pythagoras used in return for his harmony of the spheres. This particular scale is credited to the most renowned ancient Greek lyre player and the inventor of the seven-string lyre, Turpinger of Mantissa, who was from the Greek island of Lesbos, approximately 710 BCE. So we have to the music, using the Pythagorean model found in Nicomachus's Manual of Harmonics, to the stars found in Plato's Timaeus, and to all the gods, which is uh, credited to Turpin. Finally, while continuing and advancing this great uh, Greek Orphic the Thagorean Platonic tradition. Brother Tony Chrysos will be using his own unique approach to the harmony of the spheres by incorporating this evening for us the live appearance of the seven planets and their successive order as they slowly become visible in the night sky tonight above New York City on Josephine Hellebach's birthday establishing for us a real, actual connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Ladies and gentlemen, Brother Tony Christmas. So, I would say it uh, approximated 
to those whose breasts your sacred fury's fire much warmed, the objects of supreme desire. Sources of blameless virtue to mankind, who form to excellence the youthful mind, who nurse the soul and give her to descry the paths of right with reason's steady eye. Commanding queens who lead to sacred light, the intellect refined from error's night. And to mankind, each holy right disclose, for mystic knowledge from your nature flows. Cleo and Edapo, who charms the sight, with thee as dead be, ministering to light. Thalia flourishing, Bolimina famed, Melbomeni from skill in music named. That Thepsipori, Urania, heavenly bright, with thee who gavest me to behold the light. Come, venerable, various powers divine, with favoring aspect on your mystics shine. Bring glorious, ardent, lovely, famed desire and warm my bosom with your sacred fire.
and I was intending to continue to go very handsome, to play a very, very handsome tip of her. Look at the books with me from Hazar, Valor, Tom and Zoom, said, seven and ten weeks ago.
Prostě sám na tom vlastně. <laughs> um, I would also like to thank uh, an invisible hero who is one of my best friends and I love him so much. And even when he's not doing things for the salon, visibly he is. Brother uh, Kings and Lara, if you can stand up. He has uh, illustrated our first official artwork for the salon. Thank you.